Hello and welcome to part one of this introduction to learning from unlabeled instructions. My name is Jonathan Grisou and I'm a PhD student from France. I'm supervised by Manuel Lopez and Pierre Boudeye, and we are part of the FLOWERS team, which stands for Flowing Epigenetics Robot and System, which is a joint lab between INRIA and Ensta Paritech. This lab is headed by Pierre Boudeye, and we are working on developmental robotics. So what is this title about? Learning from instructions means that someone, so let's say a human, is providing instructions to, let's say, a robot in order to teach something to this robot. Such instructions are usually labeled by their symbolic meaning. For instance, an instruction can be a guidance word, such as go left or go right, or a feedback on the robot actions. Was it correct or incorrect? Therefore, when we say learning from unlabeled instructions, we assume that the robot is not aware of the meaning of the words it receives. It only knows that there is hidden labels associated to the instructions it receives. That is why we use the word unlabeled and not unknown. So to sum up, we have the robot which does not know what to do because he needs to learn and it doesn't know which signals will be used to tell him what to do. It, mut it must learn both at the same time. So I will start to explain the motivation of this work. So we are a team of developmental robotics, which means we study mechanisms that allow robots and humans to acquire autonomously and cumulatively a repertoire of novel, novel skills over extended period of time. So this includes mechanism for learning by self-explorations, as well as, as learning through interaction with peers. And as you can understand, in this work we want to learn from others. And learning from others in robotics is called social learning. And in social learning we want to teach robots new skills in the most intuitive way as possible. That means no programming, because no one's except a few percent of the population knows how to program and we want to do it by talking, by giving feedback or directing uh, the robot as we do with other humans. So in human-robot interaction scenario, we usually have a user that is in front of a robot and there is a context. So the context here is to do something with the blocks. So the user has something in his mind, a uh, construction, and to explain the robot what to do, it may use vocal words. And those vocal words may um, be feedback on what the uh, robots try to do or guidance to tell him exactly what to do, which blocks to take. But the main problem is that the robots need to understand what the user tried to say. So what we may do is to use an off-the-shelf speech recognizer that will do this job for us. It will translate a speech wave into a label, which is, for example, a speech wave that means yes will be translated to a label that is correct. And using this label, this information that is symbolic, the robot can learn what to do. But the problem is that a universal speech recognizer does not exist. And more importantly, people may not use the same word as the robot is programmed to understand. People may not use the word yes to mean correct. They may use good, for example. Therefore, to be more accurate, what we do is we usually train a specific classifier which is adapted to the particular vocal characteristics and preferences of the user. This requires to collect vocal samples from the user and have an expert creating and tuning the classifier. And in realistic scenario at homes, we will meet different people with their own preferences or skills and limitations and this process hardly scales because we cannot predict what people will use at home. Consequently, if we want to put a robot in every home and have this robot adapted to the user preferences and not the user 
adapting to the robot, we need to send an engineer in the box. And that is obviously not, po not possible. So in this work, we are trying to build an adaptive classifier that can replace the need of the engineer collecting and tuning the classifier. So we need to adapt automatically and online to its users. But remember that this classifier is used to teach a robot to do something that it does not know yet how to do. This means that the robot doesn't know what to do, neither which signals will be used to tell him what to do. So it must learn the task and the classifier at the same time. So how do we formalize this problem for our research? So this is a toy example. So during this series of video, I will use several toy scenarios as tutorials to guide you in understanding the main concept of this work. So what you see on the left side is the world, so grid, a grid world, three by three, with a robot inside. The robot will move, and the teacher will assess the action of the robot, in our case telling him if the action was good or bad. And this word or gesture, whatever modality it is, will be represented as a fixed length feature vector. So for example, this dot represents a spoken word and is a response of a movement of the agent. So the task is sequential. You need to plan your action to perform the task. And we have an interaction loop, which is very basic. You have the robot in a state that performs an action, and then the user provides its instruction, which is represented in this space. And the robot must learn where to go, knowing that there is only nine possible places to go, and that the user will provide, in this case, feedback. So let's see how it looks. So if we run it, you see the robot moving and the feedback from the user being plotted in this two-dimensional feature space. So all the problems we will consider in the following videos and in this work will be an extended version of this toy scenario, which means a more complex world and more complex features. So we can represent this problem in another way. We have this ro the robot, which is this gray box, which have internal components. And from outside, it can produce actions, which leads to new sensations. And he has this human providing instruction from another channel. So to learn the task, the robot need to translate the human instruction into something he knows which is, we may call it the feedback model. And what he knows, we call it trajectories if we are considering inverse reinforcement learning scenarios. And so when you receive new sensation, it, it transform it into its own state. And using the information from the human, he can take new decisions that should improve his performances on what the humans wants him to do. The usual first and logical reaction is to say that it is impossible to learn something if we do not know what the instruction means, if we cannot translate the human instruction into something the robot understands. And indeed, for successful communication, the human and the robot need to share a common background. And usually, this common background is the meaning of the signals. That means the robot just knows what the user said. But we want to release this assumption, so the robot will be aware of the context of the interaction, which means he wants to take the cubes and do something with the cubes, but also of the possible meanings the human may use to teach him something new. So he ex is expecting to hear something that means yes or no, or that means go left, go right. So this is the end of this video, and at this point, you should understand what is the problem we are trying to solve, and why we are trying to solve this, and why it is relevant to the community. And importantly, you should also understand the specific constraints we will consider in this work, which is the set of possible tasks is known, and the possible meanings are known. 
So in next video, we will describe in very intuitive way the algorithm we developed to solve this problem. And we will demonstrate how it works in two different scenarios. The first one is a pick and place experiment using real spoken words as the modality. And the second one is a brain computer interface scenario where the same algorithm, and that's important, will be used with an other difficult modality, which are brain electrical potentials. Thanks for watching this introduction and I see you on next video.